Hi there, welcome to Get Lit, a program to celebrate Bay Area authors. My name is Pete Crooks. I'm senior editor and senior writer at Diablo Magazine. And today on Get Lit, we have Joshua Braff, a terrific Oakland-based writer who um, is the author of the 2004 book, The Unthinkable Thoughts of Jacob Green, and 2010's Peep Show. Welcome, Joshua. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. Well, not only are you um, uh, here to talk about your brand new book, but you are also teaching uh, writers here in the East Bay at St. Mary's uh, College. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, just recently, without even um, setting out any flares that I was interested, although I, I, I am interested in teaching and have taught quite a bit in my life, um, an old I went there from 95 to 97, the first MFA program that St. Mary's had. Uh, and uh, one of my teachers who was still there said, how'd you like to teach uh, craft of fiction, a postgraduate level class? In, uh, in, in there would be poets, there would be short story writers and novelists. And uh, I jumped at it. Um, teaching is a great way to learn. And also, a r as a writer, there's a great deal of time that's spent in, by yourself. And here I have colleagues you know, very talented people, uh, some of them, all of them, <laughs> um, that I can talk to. And we, we, di we dissect novels and we talk about sentences and transitions and all the little intricacies that go into making a novel move and, and be remembered by people. So I'm really enjoying it. So let's talk about your books. Um, Peep Show came out in June of this year. Yes. And uh, this book is set in uh, 1975 in Times Square, and it, I was in New York a, a little while ago, and um, Times Square right now is not at all like it was in 1975. So you can talk about a little bit about the setting in this book and then the characters and, mm -hmm. and, and the overall uh, mission you had for this, for this piece of work. Yeah. The impetus came from a conversation I had with uh, someone who said that he used to work with a man who was known as the Peep Show King of Times Square. And this man lived in the suburbs of Long Island with four or five kids and his wife, and they were Orthodox Jews. But during the day, he would get on the train or drive into Manhattan to, to the seven, what, what had happened to the Times Square area in the early 70s all the way to the 80s or 60s into 70s, where it kind of became more of Smutville, USA. Uh, there was a certain danger to it, um, and people walked the streets, and their eyes were kind of half there, and um, you weren't sure what was coming around the corner. Many, many beautiful buildings are in that area that were once theaters that showed first-run films uh, in the 40s and 50s. And to keep up with the Joneses, this character of mine, this father in Peep Show, he needs to get a Peep uh, peep show system going in his brand new theater, in his, not in his brand new theater, but the theater that his father gave him. So in other words, you've got this beautiful theater, but the times have changed. A peep show window must go in. And uh, this is about this father and his family uh, who live in New Jersey in the book. And he commutes each day to go be a major player in the peep world of Times Square in New York. Um, his son, is very uncertain about what he wants to do, and that's our protagonist. He's 17 years old, and his father's saying, you should come work for me. And meanwhile, his mother, who's trying to forget her past, which involves the Times Square, has become what they call a, a balchuva, a convert from uh, non-practicing Jew to very severe sect of Hasidic Judaism. So she's saying, come wear the black, come understand my world, and dad is saying, come to Times Square because you don't want to be a Hasid. And uh, so it's two worlds that a lot of people don't know about. The Times Square world, which no longer exists. You were just there. It's a very, very inviting place. It's lights and, right, and tour buses. And it's changed completely. It's either you know, Disney-fied or Giuliani-fied because everything changed after uh, Rudolph Giuliani became mayor. And this other world of Hasidic Judaism, which is much like the Amish world, uh, how cut off from secular life it is, the black garb on girls below the elbows and, and knees. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was my goal, is to bring out these two worlds and, and, and strangely enough, see if they paralleled. That's fascinating. There's a great essay by uh, one of my favorite writers, Carl Hyacin, 
in a book he wrote called Team Rodent, How Disney Devours the World. <laughs> and it's, he, he makes the case that the Disney store in Times Square was the tipping point for the sort of um, scrubbing clean of that Times Square, but that he liked the seedier, more real um, Times Square. Uh, was it your goal? You grew up in New Jersey. Yes. Was it your goal to sort of revive the um, the the grit and, and texture mm -hmm. of that? And and what was that like to revisit? You must have been pretty young when when uh, this this time this time period you're writing about. Right. Um, I was born in 1967, so I'm 42 years old. I went to NYU in the late 80s, graduated in 91. So for one semester during that time, I lived in Hell's Kitchen, 43rd and 10th, very close to that area. It was on its way up, but it certainly was not there yet. And so a lot of those textures that I uh, was surrounded by, um, I took with me. And it was, it was, like Jimmy Breslin said that too, I don't want Mickey Mouse, I want the... I want the prostitutes and I want the, you know, all that walk the streets in those days. Um, I, I don't wholeheartedly agree. I think that New York being a beautiful, inviting city is better for New York. Um, and it, it really, really has changed. I don't, I don't need the, uh, the danger side of it necessarily anymore, but that was very, very exciting. And there was an electricity to it, which is not, not lost in New York. It's unlike any other place for that. Um, the melting pot of it is, is unique to other melting pot cities. Um, but I really did, uh, there was something about that that I enjoyed and I did want to bring, bring back, or when I got the idea to create this fiction based on what I knew, it was going to be exciting because I, I knew there were certain rich textures from, from those days. Um, so yeah, I found myself there and, uh, and because I wanted my own space and it, uh, it ended up being in Hell's Kitchen. But um, I do remember traveling from New Jersey to Manhattan. My dad uh, took us to a lot of Broadway shows and so I think that also fed into my creative interests and uh, he would take us to see drama on stage because mm -hmm. in Northern Jersey, Manhattan was 20 minutes away. So it's sort of like a suburb of, of the city. And um, I think that's one of the reasons that there's a lot of actors and writers and filmmakers that come out of New Jersey. Is that proximity to, to the the excitement of Broadway and, and all those things? Exactly. Um, as a film buff, I am fascinated by that period in the early '70s where pornography pervaded Main, Main Street USA. It right. wasn't just Times Square. I mean, if you, that we were discussing just before we started the documentary Inside Deep Throat about that film Deep Throat, which was a huge touchstone in, in popular pornography. I guess uh, it played. 24 hours a day in the Times Square's theaters that it opened in. But even here in Walnut Creek, squeaky clean Walnut Creek, I remember growing up, the El Rey Theater, which was the built in 1937 Main Street Theater, was showing Foxy Nurses or whatever between 74 and 76. Over in Concord, the State Theater, which was a downtown movie theater, was the only theater in the U.S. that was showing uh, porn movies and was owned and managed by a church. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, and it's still a church now. They don't show the porn movies anymore. Um, what about that? The church prevailed, the, the porn did yeah, not. Yeah, the church, and the rock, paper, scissors. Uh, <laughs> but what about that period of time where there was this sort of public, uh, I mean, certainly that industry has gone all online now, and, right. and, and, and that was not available at the time. But what was it about, again, that, that fed the texture of, uh, and fascination that you had with kind of recreating that time period? Well, um, I guess from, from the porn angle, when you're, writing a f when you're writing a fiction, you can't just go straight at it. That's what my editor called the ich factor, mm -hmm. you know, like, whoops, too much. So it was a balance of, of talking about that world. And as you said, Deep Throat came out in early 70s and it became sort of mainstream. The world couldn't believe what they were seeing and it was, uh, and so in a sense, it would never be the same in, the, in this regard that we are a pretty, we are a Christian country, but we are one that is also sexual and, and, and interested, but very quietly interested, mm -hmm. and you got to be careful. And um, So the notion of, of balancing that world, which we all know to some extent, it's, it's taboo, but it is what it is. It should be behind closed doors to keep it away from kids. That world up against a religious world that... Uh, 
in the Hasidic world, as you, as you might have noticed in the book, there's a lot of there's wig wearing. Mm -hmm. So I thought there would there could there w it was interesting that there was this hiding of the natural hair because from from the Hasidic point of view, the natural hair is uh, uh, quite a, a modest thing. You want to hide that, but the women now cover it with other hair. So in the porn world, in this in this theater, there's a great deal of masking of of who you are as well. And so I think that was the great idea of, of capturing the porn world in the 70s, which is pre, just pre-Betamax, you know, mm -hmm. pre, um, and certainly pre-internet, was here it is, it's out in the open, this is where people are coming, the business bo is booming, and never stopped booming, even with the end of Times Square. And um, it's, it's, it's a charade, it's, it's, it's dress-up, and it's fantasy, and it's taboo. And um, I guess my, my goal was to see if um, some of those things could also be said about some religious worlds that are certainly repressive. It's a, it's a daring melange that you've <laughs> created there. Have you received uh, any flack, any feedback uh, in, in a negative sense? Uh, not really. I th I, I, with both books, I received a little flack from people who didn't read the book but read reviews and then out of context uh, pieces from it. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to note that my uh, my intention was not to say Hasids are have no right, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a very much in my writing as well to each his own. Uh, the, there are characters in the book who question some of the dogma that's happening and and some of the hypocrisy that might rise uh, from the dogma. Um, but um, one of my first interviews was with a Jewish newspaper uh, for Peep Show. One of my first interviews was from a Jewish newspaper out of Tel Aviv, and he said, and I was a little nervous, like here we go. And he said, I, I think you have a lot of respect for the character that is a Hasid, and I can see that there's empathy there. And I was really glad, because it took a lot of work to, it, it wasn't about going and bashing J Jews or Hasids or anything. I am a Jewish person. I hope everyone knows that. Um, it was more about um, w how it unfolded allowed me to be shown as someone who does feel empathy for someone who's trying to change their life. Mm -hmm. Any way you need to, if it's not going to harm anyone else, please change your life and find a better route for yourself. Wake up and be happy. But if you're going to grab the kids on your way, isn't it better? Aren't, aren't we as parents in the, in the business of creating individuals? And how is that done if you're not allowed to touch a man's hand before you marry him or look in his eyes because of something that's written in ancient texts? The Hasids follow the rules of the Talmud and the Bible and the interpretations of those over the years. So, human condition stuff, really. Right. Not, not religion so much, but human condition. You know, hear me, let me live, let me, let me learn how to live. Um, I, I also noticed on your website there was a playlist of, of songs from the 70s, or there's a, re a reference to it. Um, so I'm curious about your writing process. Uh, what kind of sh um, influences do you use to sort of create that, uh, that texture? And what, what, what are the songs on that playlist? The playlist came about um, someone at my publisher, Algonquin, said, hey, I wanna, I'm sending out the book in galleys to all the salespeople around the country. I'd like to send a CD as well to capture the, the, the time. And there's Sly and the Family Stone and Springsteen. And we're talking New York in the 70s, New mm -hmm. York, New Jersey. Springsteen, B David Bowie, uh, Lou Reed, um, uh, who else is on? Donna Summers on there. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you listen to these songs, and if you were around then and listen to the radio, it takes you right back to those days, whether you're in Walnut Creek or Times Square. Right. And um, so we put it together, and um, it was kind of cool. I was in, I've been interviewed. Peep Show came out on June 1st, so a lot of people have asked about it, and it's. Uh, uh, I'm a very, very big music fan, and um, I, I am influenced by music. Certainly, um, emotion is easily found in it for me, and the way that it's used in film and soundtracks uh, to create mood. And so, um, it was it was a fun task for me. Um, getting inspired and getting in the chair, what gets me going? Um, since we're sitting in this beautiful library, I actually wrote both books in two different libraries. Oh, great! Which yeah. libraries? The UCSF Medical School Library in San Francisco on Parnassus, a place where they don't ask for ID. It's extremely clean, wonderful views. And that just became my office, and I had my favorite cubicle. And Sometimes there'd be a medical student in it, and I'd have to rough him up, joking. And then um, the next one, Peep Show, I wrote um, 
on campus at Berkeley, the Doe Library, which is a beautiful high ceiling, like museum sort of, sort of building. Mm -hmm. um, so um, many, many days walking through the stacks to my various cubicles in, in libraries. Uh, jumping back to the playlist, your brother is the filmmaker uh, Zach Braff, yeah. uh, who had a huge success um, with the film Garden State, which he wrote and directed. Um, that film uh, had an enormous subsidi subsidiary, which is, was its soundtrack uh, right. collection of songs. Um, did you uh, were you talking with Zach about putting those songs together? How did that come uh, that come together? Do you know? Um, Zach uh, had written that script before he became the star of Scrubs, mm -hmm. and um, how Hollywood works is if you get if you become the star of a TV show, there's going to be more doors open to you. So he took the same script and started to shop it around, and then he was getting nibbles. And uh, as it was unfolding, he always had certain songs going in his head as he wrote that script. And I think that's the way he writes. Sometimes he even puts the songs in the script. Uh, because, again, th uh, what, are we go what, what emotion are we capturing here? So much work can be done in a scene as opposed to writing a scene in a novel because you have the music going. I think of uh, The Graduate using uh, Simon and Garfunkel. Uh, it's just Simon and Garfunkel throughout but subtly throughout. And I think that um, Garden State is very, very successful in using that. And there's nobody who doesn't love the Garden State soundtrack. It won a, it won a Grammy in the same year that the uh, uh, Ray Charles um, soundtrack was up. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Z Zach's never picked up a musical instrument in his life, but he has a Grammy. I've held it. And um, Interesting. he made one heck of a mix, right? Right. And <laughs> that's all it was. It was a mix, and then he applied it to his film so beautifully. So that's one of his talents. With uh, Simon and Garfunkel on the soundtrack. Simon too. and Garfunkel. I thought of Good Will Hunting as well with um, Elliot Smith used subtly throughout. Um, so important in film, and uh, if it's done well, right. it can that, really turn that's things the around. That's the key. There's the it has to be done well. well y the the well-selected playlist mm -hmm. that suits the film, and then there's... Julia Roberts trying on dresses in Pretty Woman with Roy Orbison just layered over it. There it is. You know, which is, it's a different experience. Right. Um, having had the success uh, that you've had with your novels and your sibling having success um, in the film industry, how have you complemented each other or shared those successes as well? We're brothers? very good friends and um, have been for a very long time. Um, and so it's always a matter of, hey, will you read this? And um, we, we share, we, sh we do that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think it, in time we'll be doing it more. Um, I, I am interested in screen and have been, um, again, when doors open, it's kind of like a, um, possibility happens. And so there's crossover, certainly, with um, writing scenes and writing dialogues. So we have an older brother who's in the, in, in the writing world as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, your first, first book, The Unthinkable Thoughts of Jacob Green, has been optioned for a film. Yes. What's the, uh, what's the status with that? Uh, from, it was, came out in 04 and there were nibbles early on and uh, a filmmaker named Michael Greenspan was, uh, had, a, had a 20 minute film at the time and maybe a commercial and I took a look and I liked the way he shot and worked with kids and uh, he actually used original music in his short uh, and so I said, we started to talk and long story short, months go by and he adapted Jacob Green, he adapted The Unthinkable Thoughts of Jacob Green, my novel into screen, 93 pages, it seemed to all be there, mm -hmm. you know, how do you, how do you take certain things and make them and put them into a cinematic uh, setting? And he did a really nice job with a writing partner of his, and he uh, optioned the, uh, we're all, s we're sort of set, but uh, money's a, a thing, and sure. he, he shot a first film with Adrian Brody, he shot a, a first feature film with Adrian Brody, and because I say Adrian Brody, Oscar winner, that could feed the next and he could get money from the same people so sure. it's a passion of his I'm, I'm moving on and he's gonna call me when it went when it might go down you it'll know? be interesting to see can you jump back in time to 2000 for that was your first published novel yes um, as a writer who has aspirations to get that book on a library shelf and, and have it in the bookstore yeah. can you talk about the satisfaction of, of finding a publisher and seeing mm -hmm. that book become a reality? Well, I think to, to accomplish at this level, you're going to, there's a lot of rejection to, and, and fighting and getting back on the horse, as it were, to find yourself in a position to, to have a publisher call you and talk about making a deal and 
there's a, it's a long road to creating something that has no promise and sitting in the chair every day and you know, walking up to the UCSF Medical School Library and kind of crossing your fingers. Mm -hmm. Your parents want to know what it is you're doing. You know? <laughs> so there's great reward in that day when they say that. And um, my books have done really, really well in libraries. I wouldn't have been able to predict that because I didn't know if I was, if I, if I had, there's some, there's some raw truth in it and some adult language and libraries have been absolutely great to me. And the books are always out, I hear, and I, I, I love coming to them. And, and, uh, and, and that book and, and Peep Show as well, but, but, but the first one especially, was extremely well received right here in the East Bay. Yeah. Thanks uh, especially to Lynn Carey and yes. the Contra Costa Times um, uh, Book Club. Can you talk a little bit about working um, yeah. with Lynn and, and, and the reaction you had going out to, um, to read in front of 800 people at the, yes. at the Regional Center for the Arts? Right. Uh, Lynn Carey um, was just sort of like the Oprah of uh, East Bay mm -hmm. and wonderful person. Everybody loves her and she somehow gathered 800 of her closest friends uh, every year for years. They, they did it at the Dean Lesher uh, Theater and uh, I was able to, I was invited for The Unthinkable Thoughts of Jacob Green and I walked out there like I do at bookstores but there were 800 uh, eager book fans and um, so that opened things up and I found myself uh, pictured huge in the Contra Costa Times with sunglasses on, summer reads and so Lynn Carey just very very good to me and then I did it again and uh, I took a while with Peep Show, uh, my second novel. Second, uh, sophomore projects are, are tricky, and uh, so I missed the Lynn Carey boat because she's in Singapore. But um, she, they, they, there's, a, there's a lot of book lovers around here, and, mm -hmm. and partly building a library like this uh, helps see that true sure. truth. You received wonderful attention for Peep Show uh, in the reviews as well as Jacob Green. On your Wikipedia page, um, it's mentioned that Jacob Green uh, reviewers um, drew correlations to you and J.D. Salinger. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of pressure is that to, <laughs> <laughs> to take on? And I how did you take that uh, yeah. response? When it first came out, I heard that. And um, it was as, is as surreal as any of, the, of any of it unfolding as being real. Mm -hmm. Yes, you are a player. Yes, you're, you have an Amazon ranking. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you're in libraries. So as those things became real, then a comment like that is, uh, a huge honor. I went and read Catcher in the Rye again after that and thought, yeah, God, I, that book meant a lot to me. But mm -hmm. there, it wasn't sitting next to me when I wrote Jacob Green. Right. Um, but I, I'm doing that as I'm teaching now. I've picked a book, um, a book called uh, Road to Los Angeles by an, an author named John Fonte, who's long gone. The um, book was written in the 30s. And it's very Salinger-esque and very Catcher in the Rye-esque. And there are things that must that just found I absorbed when I was reading it years ago, and there's you can see some of the vo some of the voice coming through in in my own way. Um, I write about sort of precocious, unheard young people, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, or I did. I'm currently not writing <laughs> from that point of view anymore, hmm. but um, influenced by people who ro wrote true wrote characters that were very true. Uh, Salinger's characters are unreliable narrators in a sense they're talking to the reader but the reader begins to question whether or not the protagonist is actually telling the truth and loneliness can be evoked through that so Salinger was an expert at it. Well it's fascinating to sort of deconstruct the DNA of an author mm -hmm. and, e and, and even find those things that are maybe unconscious in your, yeah. in your backstory yeah. but uh, this has been really really interesting and congratulations on the success with Peep Show and, and for writing such a kind of a, a, a deliciously textured book. I, I really enjoyed going through it. Um, Joshua Braff, it's been very interesting. Thanks for coming on Get Lit. Thanks for watching Get Lit. Uh, we'll be back soon with more local authors, and please tune in for that.